Hey everyone, this is Peter Sko for Music is a Journey. It's a beautiful day here, March 29th in Saitama Prefecture, Japan. Look at this lovely weather. And you know what? They actually announced that this weekend they didn't want people going out because, well, of course, the coronavirus, right? It's not an official lockdown, but they're just requesting that everybody stay indoors, don't go out for anything unnecessary. And especially because we're at the peak of the cherry blossom season, the last few days the parks have been full of people going out anyway in spite of the virus starting to pick up around here. Uh, yeah, they've been going out, they've been having their picnics, putting out their leisure sheets, doing all sorts of stuff that they actually shouldn't really be doing. I'm kind of thinking because the coronavirus hasn't really been spiking in Japan as it has been in other countries. Um, people are becoming a bit complacent and they're thinking, well, we're not suffering the same kind of level of crisis as we're seeing in Italy or some other countries. So probably it's cool to just go out and hang out in the park anyway. I mean, we're outdoors, right? Yeah, well, still social distancing is hard to practice when you're all gathered together on leisure sheets in the park. Anyway, so yeah, um, I guess Mother Nature's been trying to help us out a bit by giving us this beautiful snowy day here at the end of March after we've had some nice warm days. The cherry blossoms are actually blooming about a, roughly about a week earlier than expected, or at least a few few days earlier than the average. But, uh, you know, I'm from Canada, I see snow, I gotta go out. <laughs> because like around here in Saitama Prefecture, we don't get much snow in the winter. We're lucky if we get one or two snowy days, and it's usually not very much. So, I heard snow was in the forecast, I thought I'm gonna do my video intro outside. And uh, as you can see, well, look around here in the park a little bit. You can see we got lots of cherry trees, we've got lots of snow coming down, and there is nobody around. In fact, just a moment ago when I was setting up the camera, they made an announcement saying that even though it's the peak of the cherry blossom season, this year they are not encouraging people to hold any events, so nobody have your picnic in the park. Well, okay, I didn't bring any food or drink with me. All right, so let's get on with this now. We are doing another episode. Where are we at now? We at episode 26 or 27? I gotta look this up. I'm gonna put it down here at the bottom of the screen then in the video when I get home later on. Anyway, we're doing an episode. Um, because this year is, as I mentioned previously, kind of the 50th anniversary of heavy metal, since we're counting back to Black Sabbath's debut album and of course Deep Purple's In Rock album, which is often considered an early metal masterpiece as well. So I thought like for today, I'm gonna go back to 1969, 70, 71, and I wanna pick out, I'm gonna mention exactly 10 heavy riffs from around that time. Now, I was listening to something the other day and I was thinking, wow, that's really a crushing riff. And you know, there are a lot of others that I know of, so I wanna make a video about this. So I thought, well, okay, I'll pick out 10 riffs. Shouldn't be too difficult. But uh, as I started going through my collection, uh, the list got longer and longer. So there were a couple of criteria I wanted to, to aim for. And first of all, we're sticking from 1969 to 1971. I'm pretty sure. I might be off by one of those or two of those, but anyway, that range. So that eliminates the, any kind of heavy riffs that came before and uh, a lot of heavy riffs that came after. Also, everybody knows about Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin. So we're not including any heavy riffs from them. And also a few other bands that are kind of well known, like Uriah Heep, of course. They had some good heavy riffs. Um, some of the more popular bands anyway, I'm not going to mention them because I'm sure everybody is familiar enough with the music that they don't need to be reminded that those riffs are heavy. I'm going to look for a little bit more of the obscure stuff that just lets you know there was more happening in the scene than, than just what history remembers as the biggest bands. One more criteria I'm aiming for, I realized there were a lot of good, heavy, like, pounding type riffs like this, and I didn't want to go for those, because what originally inspired me to make this video was a just slow, heavy, crunching, doomy riff with lots of distortion. So I'm looking more for those, like, those riffs that just really kind of like take your skull and just rub it into the ground and, you know, slowly grinding it down, as opposed to the pounding riffs that go like this. So there were a lot of bands like Japan's Blues Creation or Australia's Buffalo. They had these, you know, da -da 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 kind of riffs. We're not going to be looking at those ones. Um, I'm picking 10. These are 10 that I felt fit the criteria best. 
some of them are kind of just borderline squeaking in and then there were others that could have squeaked in or could have been in there that I decided not to for some reason or another. Uh, for example, Japan's Flower Traveling Band, their song Satori One, that has some great riffs in it, but there was something I thought, eh, put that one off a bit to the side here. Um, and there were a few other ones too, so let's just go ahead and take a look at basically 10 good, distorted, heavy, doomy type riffs from that period, 6971. And at the end, I'm just going to mention a couple of others that almost could have made it as well. So, um, oh, one more thing to mention. When I uh, actually include music in my videos, typically I ask for permission. Uh, if I'm going to include like 30 seconds, 40 seconds of music, it's exactly because I'm in contact with the artist. I can send them a message and say, hey, do you mind if I use your music in the video? I usually get the okay. And that's what I've been doing for a lot of the episodes. However, recently, uh, especially during the Ningen Isu video series I've been doing, I've been sneaking in short clips, like of about four or five seconds, just to give a quick taste of what the music sounds like. Um, and I'm being kind of sneaky about doing that. I know if the clip is too long, it runs the risk of getting picked up by the um, YouTube uh, snooper algorithm type things that look for longer samples of music. So I've been keeping it pretty short. This time around here, in order to get the full flavor of the riff in there, I might have to push it to about eight seconds or so, which means I'm running the risk of getting picked up and possibly getting blocked. And a couple of years back, I actually made a short video of about five, uh, six, eight minutes long, where I was including maybe about like 15 second clips from um, early heavy songs from around the same period. And after about six months or even two months, the video got blocked in some countries exactly because of uh, one of the bands I featured, that riff there. Anyway, that part of the song that I featured was just picked up and blocked. So I am running a risk. Um, if this video gets blocked, I'm going to re-release it again with those blocked parts cut out and just put a little disclaimer and saying, sorry, we got blocked or something. But anyway, that's enough yattering here and um, I'm going to get back home now, sit down at my little table with all my CDs and I'm going to talk to you about those heavy riffs from there. 10 heavy riffs, 1969 to 1971. Here we go. Oh, jeez. Forgot my jacket. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So, 1969 to 1971, 10 killer riffs. First one we're going to take a look at is a song called Melvin Laid an Egg by Blood Rock. Now, Blood Rock were one of those American bands from the early 70s that were part of the heavy rock movement. You had Grand Funk Railroad, Sir Lord Baltimore, and Blood Rock were probably like the top three of the heavy bands. Not to forget Dust as well, but... Um, Looking at Blood Rock. Now, Blood Rock released, I think, the first four albums were this kind of groove laden uh, heavy rock with a lot of organ. There's a lot of soul in it too at times. I have listened to samples of their second, third, and fourth album. Um, the second album features a song called DOA, which is often cited as one of the eeriest or most uh, creepiest, haunting, whatever songs of the early 70s. Um, personally, I prefer the debut album. I have that. I think it's great. A lot of heavy riffs on there, a lot of cool tracks. Melvin laid an egg. That riff is the really standout one. So let's now give a listen to the riff from Blood Rock's debut album from 1970, Melvin laid an egg. <laughs> Okay, next up, another track from 1970. Um, when Vanilla Fudge split up, bass player Tim Bogart and drummer, is it Carmen Apice? Carmen Apice? Sorry, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anyway, they wanted to form a band together with Jeff Beck, and things were getting together, but then Jeff Beck got into a car accident, and um, he was indisposed for quite some time, so they brought in another guitarist, whose name was Jim McCarty, which happens to be the name of the drummer of the Yardbirds, but, you know, obviously different people. 
And then they also brought in vocalist Rusty Day, who had been with Atomic Rooster. So, they got these guys together and they recorded, I think they recorded three albums with that lineup. However, during the sessions for the first album, they recorded a song called Rumblin' Man. All right, now this was actually not released until it came out on a compilation in 1996. But in 1970, they did this Rumblin' Man song, and it is based on the Link Ray and the Rayman um, instrumental track, Rumble. And as you know, the riff for that track there, if you've heard it, it's like, dun, dun, dun. And it follows a kind of like 12 bar blues thing. And it's kind of slow, but it's a bit gritty and distorted. And a lot of people back in the 1950s were really blown away by the mood that set. So these guys went ahead and just totally hammer it. Um, this song is listed as like proto sludge metal even. So you, you've just got to hear this. I'm going to play a bit of that there. I mean, the band is just pounding it. You got to think Cactus are actually a kind of blues rock, southern rock, hard rock band. And then they go ahead and they do this. All right, now when it comes to early heavy music, one of the tracks that frequently comes up on lists on YouTube is a track called Distortions of Darkness. And the band, oh, I gotta check here, the Firebirds or the 31 Flavors. Okay, they were called the 31 Flavors at the time they recorded Distortions of Darkness. They recorded this on the Crown label. Basically, Crown asked them to record some popular songs. One of them was Light My Fire, which is when they were the, the Firebirds in 68. And then they had to do uh, something from Hair, soundtrack for Hair in 1969 when they were the 31 Flavors. So they did these uh, studio recordings and they were allowed to fill up the rest of the album space with whatever they liked, which basically sounds like a lot of studio jamming. There are some songs they put together, they have some lyrics and so on, but it doesn't sound like a band who are really well developed in their sound yet. But uh, Distortions of Darkness, it was originally a song from 1968 and then they turned it into an instrumental for 1969 and just flooded the distortion. I mean, it's just a distortion coming in everywhere. So it's um, not as doomy as some other ones, but just the sound gets noticed a lot by people. So let's give it a bit of a listen here now. Distortions of Darkness by the 31 Flavors. Okay, next up I want to mention Stone Garden, a band out of Idaho, who actually were going from somewhere around 64, 65, a couple of brothers and some friends who got together and made a band, and somewhere around 1969, 1970, they, their sound gradually got heavier, and around that period there they really laid down the distortion and the heavy guitar, heavy distorted guitar tracks. Now, the guitarist, Paul Spear, I actually mentioned him back in, I don't know, was it episode 8, episode 9, when I was listing episodes? I haven't exactly given that up. But anyway, um, I'll, I'll put the link thing up here somewhere. But anyway, Paul Spears, the guitarist, and he later on went and did this um, work with David Lance, who's a pianist, and they would do these kind of like um, new age type things. And he also did some work with uh, the drummer Scott Rockenfeld of Queensryche, which you can you can see all all that kind of stuff in that video there that I did previously. However, back here with Stone Garden in 1969, 1970, they did this one track called Assembly Line and they it's a pretty good heavy hard track and you should hear just this heavy riff right in this part here is brilliant. <laughs> Okay, I am also going to mention that Paul Spear is releasing a new album. What's it called now? Sonoran? Oh, I'll put the album cover here anyway. But if you go to his, his website, paulspear.com, 
you can not only listen to or and, and order the album, but you can also hear most of his discography on there. I think he owns the rights to most of the albums that he's done, so you can listen to his stuff for free there and uh, download and so on. So do check it out. That's Paul Spear, and this was Stone Garden Assembly Line from about 1969-1970. I'm not 100% sure of the recording date, but it's around that time. Okay, I want to move on to The Misunderstood. I talked about them a couple of videos back when I was talking about 50 songs that led up to heavy metal and The Misunderstood, I mentioned them twice I think, they were an American band who was very heavily influenced by the Yardbirds, they were a band out of California, and they met up with John Peel who suggested they go to London, so they did in 1966 and their guitarist, one of their guitarists decided to leave and so they met up with Tony Hill, an English lead guitarist, as he emphasized, and they recorded a few tracks, but just before making it to the big time, their singer Rick Brown was called away uh, to fight in Vietnam. That's a story in itself because he ran away from that, <laughs> went off to India. But um, anyway, the band basically had to go back home, nothing happened. Um, the career was kind of over and then someone in the UK decided to try to get the misunderstood going again so they called up the was it the steel lap guitarist Glenn Campbell and uh, another member of the band and they brought in a new singer and I think it was a new drummer and they were going to record one album in 1969 and now the album was basically going to be a blues rock album but they were told to come up with one psychedelic track and they hadn't prepared anything and they were sitting around in the studio and I think things were not going very well and the vocalist was kind of really bummed out about how things were going but they had to do something and so Glenn Campbell, not the famous country singer, a uh, country performer, but Glenn Campbell, the, the guy from Misunderstood, he said, okay guys, I've got something so I'm just gonna start playing and you follow me and so he just started playing this really heavy, doomy type distorted uh, steel lap guitar thing and the rest of the band just followed the vocalist just followed and everything was just made up on the spot all the lyrics were made up on the spot everybody just tried to you know get in the groove and go along with it and it is it is pretty doomy and we're talking 1969 here so let's listen to a little bit of this this heavy guitar bit here from the misunderstood and a song called golden glass Okay, one band coming out of the UK was called Jerusalem and their album, I think it was around 1971 or so, they were recording an album and for their producer, they got Ian Gillen of Deep Purple to produce the album for them. Now there were a lot of bands around that time who were recording rock albums with some heavy tracks as well as some acoustic tracks. I think Humble Pie is a good example of a band that was very much like uh, heavy blues based rock with some acoustic folk stuff and so on but Jerusalem were exactly a heavy rock band even you could call it proto metal or first wave of heavy metal band that's what their whole album was and you could expect heavy distorted guitar and lead solos and you know lyrics about skeletons and whatever but um yeah there was one track called primitive man where they really hit hard and maybe not as hard as Rumblin Man by Cactus but in a similar vein it's a pretty heavy hitting track so let's listen to a little bit from Primitive Man Primitive Man by Jerusalem just catch this riff here Okay, another band that I mentioned previously is Iron Claw. Again, I mentioned them in this video, the 50 songs leading up to heavy metal. Iron Claw were very much influenced by Black Sabbath. They were a Scottish band. Um, for their original shows, they would actually play through Black Sabbath's debut album in its entirety. And then they started writing some of their own original songs. And all of these early songs are pretty damn heavy stuff in the league of Black Sabbath and one song Skull Crusher is absolutely my favorite one uh, the riff in that is 
is something that could have come out of the new wave of British heavy metal in the 80s. In fact, it reminds me a lot of a band called Tyson Dog. It sounds like something they might have done. So you've got to hear this riff, but on the extra little side note, um, Iron Claw, and by the way, that comes from the King Crimson song, 21st Century Schizoid Man, Cat's Paw, Iron Claw, the opening lyrics. Yeah, they actually wanted to get picked up and they, they um, sent the recordings off to Black Sabbath to say, hey, would you like to manage us? And Black Sabbath's management just said, you guys are way too close to what we're doing. Stop it. <laughs> but anyway, let's check this out. This is Skull Crusher. What's really cool I like is they have the guitar solo and then at the end of the guitar solo, the band just stops and just the bass plays the riff and then the band comes back in again. Let's hear that part and hope nobody blocks this. Okay, another really cool band is May Blitz. I think they recorded two albums in the early 70s. They were two Canadians in England with two Englishmen, so a four-member band. And I have their second album called May 2nd. Good title for May Blitz's second album. And one of the tracks is Snakes and Ladders. Now, the first half of the song is just kind of like, you know, groovy, cool type song. It has this like kind of groove to it. But then the second half, it just drops down and this fuzzy, like really heavy distorted guitar riff comes in and there's a few more lyrics. And then after that, the band is just doing this kind of like, oh, this kind of like a almost eerie, ominous chanting going along and more distorted guitar effects come in. It is really cool. Excellent example of really doomy metal riff from the early 70s. So let's give that a listen. This is just the, the heavy riff from Snakes and Ladders by May Blitz. All right, another band I've talked about before too, Dionysus. They are out of Quebec. They were a progressive rock band in the 1970s. However, their first album, I think it actually came out in 1971, um, recorded in 70, released in 71. Anyway, um, it's called Le Grand Jeu, the big game. And it is a pretty heavy psychedelic rock album. Lots of distorted guitar, lots of like organ and so on. However, uh, the very last track, Agne de Deux, Lamb of God, sorry, my French pronunciation is not very good. It is a really cool, heavy track with guitar and organ and this kind of like Sabbath-esque solos. And that goes on for the first four minutes. And then the last two minutes, just this really cool, like heavy distorted riff comes in. Um, freaking awesome. So I'm going to play a little bit of that one there now so you can hear what that sounds like. Okay, song number 10. This one is really worth mentioning. This is a song called Dead Meat. It is about 15 minutes long. It's by a band called Boulder Dam. They were a really small time band. They recorded an album. I think they printed like 500 copies or something like that. And most of the album is your kind of standard early 70s rock, guitar rock type band. But this song, Dead Meat, it is a 15 minute epic that is in, I think it's like in four parts. And it starts off pretty good. It's got this really nice kind of, you know, early doom metal sound to it and goes into a kind of more lighter part. But it's the part, I think it's around like after 10 minutes, they end into this really awesome riff. It's just fantastic. It's one of my favorite heavy riffs from the early 70s. Um, and apparently what they did for their live performance for this song, uh, the singer would be sacrificed on stage and they would pull out his heart, which of course was actually an animal heart that they got from a, a butcher. <laughs> and they would like pull that out and the singer would die and later on he would re-emerge, come back to life, coming out of a coffin or something like that. I mean, it was apparently quite a performance that they did. But uh, anyway, let's listen to that riff that comes in. I think it's at around 10 and a half mark or 
eight and a half minute mark. I forget. It goes on for quite a bit. But anyway, check it out. This is really cool. This is Boulder Dam. Okay, a few other songs I just want to mention. One of them is um, a band called Tractor. They had a song called All Ends Up. I have listened to samples of the album because All Ends Up is another one of those heavy riff songs, really distorted, flooding distortion guitar sounds um, that frequently get mentioned on these YouTube lists. I listened to the rest of the album through, I think it was uh, iTunes, it didn't really strike me as being a particularly heavy album. There's a lot of acoustic tracks, but that one song all ends up. It's really got some cool, doomy atmosphere, heavy riffing. But um, I'm not going to play that one because I actually don't own the album. I just have the song off iTunes. Another band to mention out of Italy, Jacula. Uh, they released an album in 69, their debut. It has, I think, three tracks on there that feature this heavy, distorted guitar. And one of them, uh, Triumphato Sad is uh, probably the standout riff for really heavy, doomy riffs. It's from 1969. I don't have the album yet. I'm still thinking if I should get it because it's largely a kind of like spooky organ type album. So I don't know if it's worth it to get it for those three tracks with the heavy guitar, but I might, I might. Okay, another one is uh, oh, this one over here, High Tide. The opening track from their debut album Sea Shanties of 1969. It's called Feudalist's Lament and that is the riff that I featured, that I included in a video I talked about at the beginning of this video where it got my video blocked. It was for that one and later on I found that song on YouTube so I'm gonna put the link up here somewhere so you can check it out but it's a really cool riff and one thing to mention about High Tide is we talked about the misunderstood before and um, how they came to London and then Tony Hill English lead guitarist Tony Hill joined the band Tony Hill is the man behind High Tide and um, guitar and vocals and instead of having a second guitarist or a keyboard player they have an electric violin player which is interesting anyway and this is often uh, pointed out as possibly being one of the early progressive metal type albums because it has the heavy rock of the early uh, 70s and at the same time it has the more progressive element as well. Um, that's something actually to discuss in a different topic but anyway that opening track Feudalist Lament, killer riff and really cool lyrics as well very doomy so. Okay there are of course plenty of other bands to mention Sir Lord Baltimore's Thy Kingdom Come is pretty cool uh, from a dry camel by dust. Um, something from Lucifer's Friend. I don't know. I could give you probably 20 songs, but the 10 that I mentioned, I thought those were really cool riffs worth bringing to the attention of everybody. Okay, we're going to wrap this up now. That is episode 27 of Music is a Journey. Really do me heavy killer riffs. I don't know. What did I call this episode? <laughs> anyway, from the early 70s. I hope you enjoyed watching. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll be back again with another video when I've got time. All right. Thank you for watching. Take care and catch you next time.